Welcome again. So in this one, we're going to go deeper into matrices. We're going to see a lot of functionalities and methods that deal with matrices. Now it's true that in lecture three of this course, we discussed matrices and arrays, but you know, it was just a small lecture. We just got to see how to create and concatenate arrays in a really fast way. In this one, we're going to go deeper into matrices and arrays and see each function, what it does, and a lot of its usefulness and its applications. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So matrices and arrays are the most important representation of information on MATLAB. You can create many common arrays and even signals using simple matrices on MATLAB. So let's start by creating the most basic matrix, which is the zeros matrix. So all I have to do is type in x is equal to zeros. And if I do that as such, I'll just get a zero, right? Um, what's really good about the functions in MATLAB is that they have variable arguments. So the same function, which is zeros in my case, could be called with one parameter, let's say five, I get a five by five zeros matrix. Well, let's say you want a five by four matrix. All you have to do is say five comma four. So this is, in programming terms, this is a function of two arguments, right? Two integers, whereas the one before it was a function of one argument. So this one should return me a matrix of size five by four, right? Also, you have n dimensions. So let's say you want a five by four by three. You're not going to be able to see it, but the third dimension contains five by four matrices. That's how you should read it. So the way I could access it is as such. This is the first matrix, second matrix, third matrix, and the fourth does not exist. You could also pass the size as such. So you can pass it as an array. So five, five by four as such, instead of saying, you know, five by four. Now this is useful when you already have a matrix, let's say this is a random matrix, right? Or this is a matrix I create, right? So A is a four by four matrix. And you know, while programming, sometimes you lose track of the size of the matrix. So let's say you're in a situation where at each iteration, the size of A is changing and you would like to keep track of the size and create another matrix of the same size. Well, you can do so easily using two lines of code. So all you have to do is say, let's say the size of A is size A, which is four by four, and then create a zeros matrix of the same size, so size of A, and there you have it. You could also do it in one line of code, so zeros of the size of A as such, because the size of A is a vector which works with the zeros function, so there you go. You can also return a zeros matrix of a certain data with a corresponding to a certain data type. So let's say you're working with images now. We'll see that later in further lectures when we discuss image processing. Um, but basically, image processing works with unassigned integers of eight bits. Let's keep it simple. We want a matrix of size three by four but of type integer that occupies eight bits. Now this is different than this. As you can see here, x is int eight, whereas y is a double. By default, MATLAB creates variables using the double. Now you can see they're different by simply adding them. So it's not that they're incompatible in size. No, both of them are three by four, but x is an eight bit integer whereas y is a double by default. So this means that you cannot add them up because eight bits do not work with doubles. Instead, you should create another variable like this, into eight, and then add x with y, and it works. And of course, the output is eight bits, which is stored in ANS. Now, this is called a type name. The int eight is called a type name, and it's the type of your variable. MATLAB comes with a bunch of different types such as double, single, unsigned eight integer, 
Now what unsigned 8 integer is, is that it doesn't have a sign. So basically, if I go ahead and say, um, and so on, you also got int 16, 32, 64, the powers of 2. Now as the zeros matrix, there's the ones matrix. It's the same as zeros, but instead of zeros, you have ones. And it follows the same rules. So create a ones matrix as such. So without any arguments or inputs, means by default it is of size one by one. The matrix is of size one by one. Let's say I want a five by five matrix, which could be expressed using one input. You can do it as such. Say I want a five by three matrix. There you go. You can also create matrices using vector inputs. So five and three as such. Or you can also call another command that depends on another function. So right now I've got a Y, which is of size three by four. So I could call size of Y as such. Even though it's of different type, which is U and eight, it doesn't matter because the size is always a double. You could also create different ones matrix with different data types. So ones, five by four, and precise the u int 8 as such. In that case, I cannot add it with another matrix of size 5 by 4 of another matrix as such because it's a double. So I have to come and specify u int 8 and it will work. Okay? Now, in case you want to, you know, you lost track in your program, you don't know if this matrix is a double or this matrix is an 8 bit integer, you can easily get that using the class function. So class of x is u into 8. Class of y is u into 8. Class of a, as you can see here, is double. Now I know you can, you know, infer it or get it from here, but when you're running a certain function or a program, um, you're not going to pause the program and go to the workspace and then get it from there. No, you should be able to do everything programmatically. You've also got the something called the like. So ones like. What does what that means is that I want a ones matrix of the same type as, let's say, x, or let's say y. Let's keep it like that. So y is u into 8. What x is now is also of type u into 8. So you want to define a certain ones matrix of the same type of another variable, which is y in our case, right? Let's do this with a different size. So I want a ones matrix that is of size 5 by 3 but it is of the same type as my y, which is 8-bit unsigned integer, like y as such. So this should be able to return a 5 by 3 ones matrix, not of type double, but of type u into 8 as such. Now, indeed, you can create a ones matrix of three dimensions, so 5 by 4 by 3. There you have it. The size is a 3 by 1 vector, a 1 by 3 vector in that case and yeah that's uh that's all i have to say about the ones matrix now let's do some more fun stuff let's talk about the random matrix or simply the rand matrix so the rand returns a random number between zero and one and for those of you into statistics and finance stuff that have to do with probability and random numbers more formally, X is drawn from a uniform distributed random generator. So what that means is that it's a sample drawn out of a uniform distribution, which is bounded between zero and one. So in case I do that again, I get another random number and again and again and so on. You could draw random matrices as such. Now this is a generalization of a uniform random number in a sense that each entry is generated using a uniform random generator between 0 and 1. Also if you specify one dimension it's a 5 by 5, 3 by 3. More than two dimensions it's a multi-dimensional random matrix. You can also specify the type name as u int 8. You can't do that because the random generator naturally generates real numbers not integers so there's uh, decimals and such and thus you cannot generate different data types other than doubles which is by default and singles you can also mimic another variable so let's say y is a random three by four of the same type as x 
So now y be a symbol. Let's say you don't want random numbers between 0 and 1. No, you want random integers. You can do so using rand i. And you want those random integers to be, I don't know, somewhere between 3 and 9. Okay, there you have it. So keep hitting. There you go. All your random numbers or integers are between 3 and 9. In case you want a matrix, you have to come and specify it right after the range. So I want a 3 by 6. There you have it. You can also create random complex numbers simply by saying this. Rand plus i times rand. Now i is always reserved for the imaginary number such that i square is minus 1 and square root of minus 1 is again i. Now in case you used i within your program like you said this then you came and did this it's no longer a complex number so you've got another notation for complex numbers which is the one i. One i is always going to be the imaginary number no matter what because you can't come and say one i is equal to two because variables are alphanumeric meaning that your variable name should always start with the alphabet, not a number. Well, how do you create random complex numbers? It's easily as that. It's, it, it's the same as the real case plus 1i times rand 5 3. Simple as that. You have to make sure that the imaginary part is compatible with the real part. They are of the same dimension. If I accidentally change this to 4, I would get an edit. Now let's say you run a program, right, and you want the same random numbers to appear multiple times, okay? What I mean is this, is that if I want x to be a random 1 by 5, those are my random numbers. I want x, I want those numbers again without having to store them in a certain database and then extract them, right? Because I'm studying a random sample from a certain environment. And I don't want a different sample again and again. No, I want to focus on this sample drawn once and only once. This is useful when you have a big data set. All you have to do is set your seed. So this is called a seed. Seed as in you save the current state of the random number generator to generate the same vector multiple times. So let's say my seed is RNG and RNG is the keyword here. So it's a controlled random number generator which sets a certain seed. So here's an example which we're going to do. So let's say I set it as such. This is my seed. It's a type twister. Really you don't need to know that. And now let's get x. x is the rand 1 by 5. So this is my x. Now if I go ahead and say y is rand 1 5 it won't give me x. So that it returns the same values as x I have to say Restore the state of the random number generator as such. Now when I say y is rand 1 by 5, it's the same as x. So x minus y is 0. Now if you're interested in the RNG random generator function, here's the documentation. Now what, you know, twister and all those stand for is, is the seed type. So, you know, if I go and type s, the type of S is twister. You've got different types such as SIMD twister, a combined multiple recursive, and so on. Those are different types of generators. Now let's say you're interested in Boolean algebra and you want to create um, matrices that contain logical stuff like and this is actually a type name in MATLAB. Like you have doubles, like you have integers, you have logical data types. So let me show you what I mean. My X is a logical zero. So one equal to two as such is a logical expression which evaluates to zero. And x is of type logical. Now another question that arises is that can I add a logical variable to a double? Well surprisingly you could. So let's say I want to add x with a double which is 15. It works or 15.3. It does work. And this is in contrast to what we saw previously when we added a double with an 8-bit integer, which didn't work. But another question is that, oh, what if in my program I'm interested in doing Boolean algebra? That is, I don't want to add a logical 1 with another logical 1 and get a 2. I don't want that. I want a 1. I want Boolean algebra. So Boolean algebra is 
simply saying 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 0 plus 1 is 1, but 1 plus 1 is not 2, it's 1. And there's a similar thing for the multiplication. Let's say you're interested in that. You don't want this plus. You want another type of plus. You can do so using the logical or and the logical and. You can do so using the pipeline as such. So this 1 plus 1 is a 1. 1 plus 0 is a 1. 0 plus 1 is a 1. And a 0 plus 0 is a 0. Note that 2 plus 2 is by default. Anything not 0 is a 1. So minus 4 plus 9 is a 1. Because minus 4 is a 1 and 9 is a, is a 1. So 1 plus 1 is a 1. You've also got the OR as such. So OR is the same as the pipeline. So OR 1 plus 1 is a 1 and this is a 0. You've got the AND and 1 times 1 is 1 and anything else is a 0. Okay? You've got the NAND. Oh no, NAND is not included. So you've, you've got the, the, the basic ones. Anything else you could reproduce it using simple OR and AND gates. The nan, this nan is not a number, okay? So let's say one divided by zero. No, one divided by zero is infinity. Nan is useful when you have a fixed sized array and you've got some indices which are possibly not going to be filled up. Let's say you've got a vector A which you filled the first entry by three and then you skip the second one and you fill the third one by a hundred. Well, the second one is going to be filled by a zero. Let's say you're, you don't want a zero, you want an NAN, because zero is one option. Maybe it's going to be filled up in the fourth position. I don't know. How do we solve this? Well, let's say your vector is initially an NAN of size four. Then you repeated your process as such, then three is 100, then four is zero. As you can see, two is an NAN. So you could easily grab those indices that are not filled up simply by saying is NAN. So MATLAB responds with zeros or ones, zeros to those that are not NAN, three, 100, and zero, and one corresponding to the positions that are truly NAN. Good, so this is a small motivation of applications of Boolean algebra, but their applications are really bigger than that. You know that logical gates, all electronic circuits, that we use nowadays are essentially founded and are based by Boolean algebra. So for that, I'm going to just pass through the true matrix. So the true matrix is a matrix of class logical. So this is the logical one. It's not the double one or the integer one. No, it's the logical one. And you can also create multidimensional true matrices or using vector input as size of the true matrix. You can also mimic. So let's say you created a random A, right? And you want the B to be the true of size four by six, but like A, you're going to get an error. And why? Because A is a double and you cannot create a logical of type double. So this doesn't work. And I think this is useless. You cannot create a like, you know, like a double, but this has a certain application. It is not completely useless. Let's say you're interested in attributes. So if you remember the who's keyword, we had attributes here, which we did not talk about. So let's say you create a sparse matrix. It's an all zero sparse matrix. And let's say it's logical. Logical, sparse, five by four. So A is sparse. To see more about A, do this. And as you can see, the attribute is sparse. Now you want a truth matrix that is also sparse. You can do that using the like. So going back here, there you have it. To make sure who's A and B, there you have it. And this is useful in particular for the logical case. It's useful when you have different attributes. So it mimics the attributes of another logical variable. Now, like the trues, there's the false. The same exact functions, the same exact functionalities, same exact usages, but instead of true, you've got the false. So I'll create an A, which is false. It's a zero, false of size five by five or five by 10. You can also pass it vector inputs to specify the size, right? Um, it could be multidimensional and it could mimic another variable using the like. So false three by four, but like A, which, it, which was sparse. No, B was sparse, so like B. So who's F 
is parts. Let's go back to a zeros. Okay, so say not f, you get the trues, right? So or f with not f. This should give me all trues because true or false is true. Now, in contrast, if I do the and, I should get all false. Now you can, this is all false, but let's say your entry, which is here, is true. So you can do so using this and then do some math like or not f or the and exactly. Um, there you have it. Now flip f. There you go. And so on. Now let's talk about the identity matrix, which is a matrix when multiplied by another matrix gives the other matrix. So it's a generalization of the one to the matrix case. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say i, and it's a, the function is called i. It has an i because usually in linear algebra this is written using the i letter, but you can also Okay, so I5 is a 5 by 5 identity matrix as such. Now, let's see what this I could do. Generate another random matrix. Well, let's keep it small, 3 by 3. And now my I is also 3 by 3. Now, try multiplying I with A. Does it give me A? Yes, it does. Now, try multiplying A with I. Does it give me A? Yes, it does. So this matrix is acts as the 1. Now the ones matrix as the one number, as the identity element in algebraic terms. Let's try to create an identity matrix that is rectangular, five by three. Now let's generate a matrix that is, that you could multiply it with the I, say a random five by five, and multiply A with I. Is it A? No, it's not. Because simply it's not of the same dimension as A. So A minus A times I is an edit or i times a. So identity matrices to be more rigorous are only defined for square matrices. MATLAB allows rectangular identity matrix as such, but it fills up the last, the additional row or the additional column with all zeros. Okay? This means that, you know, the identity should be square, but I'm going to be generous with you and add one more rows of zeros, okay? You've also got identity matrices of type, um, let's say uint8, it works, so that you could multiply matrices of type uint8, so let's say ones, three by three, type uint8. Let's try scaling an identity matrix, get a two, a 20, and so on. You don't want ones on the diagonal, you want something else. Now let's talk about the diagonal matrix or the diagonal operator. When you've got a vector, let's say x, and you want to create a diagonal matrix containing elements of x, you could do so using the diag method as such. Now, in case you pass diag another argument as such, what happens is that it will create another matrix, but place on the super diagonal. Super diagonal means the diagonal that comes on top of the main diagonal, called super diagonal. So you've got super diagonals and sub diagonals. So this is a super diagonal, this is a super diagonal, and so on. As you can see, the elements are floating onto another super diagonal. So the main diagonal is indexed by zero, right? And a similar argument holds for sub diagonal. This is in case you pass diag another integer. It should not be a decimal because you cannot, you know, it's an index. Now, let's say you pass a matrix. Let's say this is my random matrix and I passed it to the diagonal operator, what happens? It will simply return the diagonal elements as such. So it works in a, a vice versa manner, okay? You specify an index as such, it will return the super diagonal elements. So 0 0.891, 0 0.6422. And let's say I say that A2 should return only this element. Three should give me an error or an empty matrix. To test for empty matrices, you do, ah no, you don't do this. You say, is it empty? So is empty as such. By the way, sub and super diagonal elements, it's okay if you've never heard of them and you will never probably hear of them, but they have a lot of applications in linear algebra. Now there's a generalization of diagonal, which is the block diagonal. And the block diagonal is simply, let's say I pass the block diagonal elements as such. It will act as the diagonal operator, right? But if I pass it matrices as such, 
So let's say my A1 is the following matrix, my A2 is a ones matrix, and my A3 is, I don't know, a matrix of that holds multiples of 10, okay? And when I say diag or block diag of A1, A2, A3, it will create a bigger matrix containing in the block diagonals A1, A2, and A3. Here's A1, here's A2, and here is A3. In case you're wondering, does block diagonal work the other way around? So let's store this matrix in a matrix called B, meaning block. Can I say block diag B? Do I expect it to return a1, a2, a3, well, no. Does it work like this? No. It will append b with another element. Block diag as such will just return b, right? So it doesn't have an inverse relation because out of block diag, I could extract a lot of, there's a lot of options. So I've got a two, got two different sizes. I've got this three by three and this three by three. I've got the scalars on the diagonal elements as such. Right? It doesn't have an inverse relation. Unless I come and specify, I want block diagonals of this size. Now let's talk about concatenating arrays. Now, we've done this previously as such. Let's say I've got an A, which is a ones of size three by three. We've got a B of size three by three, right? You can concatenate them as such, one next to the other, or one on top of the other. And don't forget that when we don't specify anything, or in other words, a white space, or when I place a comma, it's the same thing. So this and this reads the same thing. This means that we're stacking them next to each other. And don't forget that a semicolon means go to the next row. So one on top of the other. Well, MATLAB has a function for that, in case you're not comfortable with notations like this, uh, some people like myself prefer this reading. And I think it's a personal opinion. If you come from a linear algebra background, this is more convenient for you, right? Because this is how you'd express it on a paper. If you don't know anything about linear algebra, it's also okay. But I think you're going to prefer the following. So there's a function called cat. And what cat does is that it simply concatenates them. CAT stands for concatenation. So if in case I come and say A and B, I have to specify how do I want them concatenating. Is it one on top of the other or is it one next to the other? So one means one on top of the other as such. Two means one next to the other. And three is stacking in a third dimension. So a two by two in the third dimension, the first element is the A and the second element is the B. In the fourth dimension, in case you want to stack them in four dimensions, the first element in the fourth dimension is A, and the second element in the fourth dimension is B. So all in all, you can do the same work with this notation using the cat as such. So the first argument stands for in which dimension you want to concatenate. Now also cat, there's some stuff useful about the cat function that you cannot do with this, or you might find it hard to do. So when you're stacking in the third dimension, so let's create a random, I don't know, two by three by four, and another random two by three by five. And I want to stack those two matrices in the third dimension. So cat in the third dimension, um, A and B. So there you see the concatenation. So I have nine elements in the third dimension. Why nine? Because the third dimension of B is 5 and the third dimension of A is 4. 5 plus 4 is 9. So they're stacking the third dimensions of the matrices A and B. If you can imagine the third dimension as a height, you're stacking A as such. This guy is in the first element of C, right? A2 is the second element of C. Until for 4, because A is a 4. And in the fifth element, you've got the B and so on, six and two, you get the point. Now, cat is also useful when you're working with tables. So we didn't talk about tables yet, but you can create tables using cells. So cell or even arrays. So let's say I've got A, which is one, two, three, and four, and B, which is 10, 20, 30, and 40. I want to create a table out of A and B. MATLAB creates a nice, printing format for A and B as such. Now, let's say I want to add another element to this table. 
So let's sort the table in T. I want to, you know, insert another element, let's say a fifth row. So you can do so using, let's say, my row that I want to insert is 550. So cat, one, T, and the row. Got an error here. Let's see this. So that's why I, I was hesitating about talking about tables because you can only concatenate variables of type cell, okay? So this is a cell which we did not cover. So keep in mind that tables are for cells, like Excel sheets. Each variable is a cell. We'll talk about those in later lectures. Now let's say you're bothered with the first index of cat. I don't want cat one to, you know, I'm, I'm happy with two dimensions. I want concatenating in a horizontal way or a vertical way. So let's recap. Let's say I've got A, which is a ones of size three by three and a B, which is a zeros. Cat one A B is concatenating one on top of the other. So instead of, you know, having to keep in mind, oh, one is for stacking one on top of the other and two is for stacking one next to each other. Well, you can do so using the functions vert cat, which stands for vertical concatenation. And you're, so you're good to go with A and B. So this is the same as this vertical concatenation. And similarly, you've got horizontal concatenation, A, which is the same as cat two, okay? Can pass it as many arguments as you want right you can also replicate matrices so let's say my a matrix is one two three four simple as that or let's keep it simple first of all let's say i've got a vector one and two and i want to replicate each element so i want one to be repeated five times or three times and two to be repeated three times so all i have to do is say replicate each element of a three times as such. So this is replicating each element. You can also replicate the vector itself. So that mat or replicate the matrix three times. So this is one, two replicated in a three by three form. In case you want a one by three, you can do this. Replicate A in a one by three fashion. Okay. This also works for matrices. So say I have this matrix, rep LM A, doesn't work for matrices unless you pass it two dimensions. So you say I want each element to be replicated twice by row and by column. They could be different as such. You've also got the rep mat for matrices. Let's say I pass it only one argument which should work. So you replicate it in a two by two fashion or two by three fashion as such. Simple as that. Now let's generate linearly spaced vectors. You know you could do so using the following notation. Let's say I want a vector that starts with zero and ends at 10. There you have it. You can do so using the line space command. So LIN space zero till 10. Now the size of Y is 100, which is the default. You have to come in the line space and state that I want 11 integers or numbers as such. In case you say 12 or I don't know, another number as such, MATLAB will create that many evenly spaced points between zero and 10. Okay, so let's say I said 100 and let's plot that out to see how it looks. As you can see, it's a straight line, which means that they are evenly separated. That's useful because if I want to do the same thing from zero to 10 using the this notation, let's say Z goes from zero to 10, right here, if I say two means skip every two, right? If I say 0.1 means skip every 0.1. So I have to actually calculate if I want 100, the, the spacing. Well, with the line space, you don't need to calculate. You just say, oh, I want 100, but given that they're equally spaced. In that case, the spacing is, let's store this, the spacing is the difference between every two elements, which is 0.101. Let's take another two elements, which come one after the other, 0.101. If I want to do the same thing with this notation, I have to specify 0.101 till 10. Now I'll get the same result. So let's clear everything out. And now let's see what the log space does. The log space is the same as the line space. It's dedicated for logarithmic values. Let's say you want to create logarithmically spaced points in the interval 10 to the power 1 till 10 to the power 6. And you're interested in 10 points. So this is my x, and as you can see, they're large values. They end at 10 to the power 6. 
And to see that, hit log 10 of x. You can see they start by 1. This is 10 to the power of 1, and they end at 6. That's 10 to the power of 6. And it's not that the linear spacing between two points are the same as the line space. No, it's the division. So x2 divided by x1 is this value, and x3 by x2 should give me the same value. So as the ratio of the last two values is also constant. So you're equally dividing on a log scale. So that's the log space. Let's say you work in signal processing because this shows up a lot. Let's say you're interested in creating points between 10 to the power a number until pi. That shows up a lot when you're working with spectra and stuff like that. So yeah, you could do so using log space, let's say one to pi as such, and you want 10 values. Here's your x. So as you can see, this is 10 to the power 1, and it goes backwards because 10 to the power 1 is greater than pi. Let's put something less than 1. Let's put 01. As you can see, they're logarithmically scaled points, equally spaced, in a ratio sense, until pi. Okay, that's it for a log scale. I'll clear everything out. Now let's talk about another type of discretization through the function called mesh grid. And we used mesh grid when we were plotting 3D figures, but we didn't go into details and talk about it. We just used it on the go. Now we'll talk about it in details and what mesh grid does, let's say I have two vectors. First one starts at zero, ends at five, and we've got 100 equally spaced points. Y goes till 10, and we have also 100 equally spaced points. What mesh grid does is that it returns a 2D grid coordinates based on the coordinates contained in vectors X and Y. So basically, it will return two matrices X, Y corresponding to lowercase X, Y, where X, uppercase X, is a matrix where each row is a copy of X, as simple as that. So if I look in the first row of X, I should be able to see lowercase X. So to make sure, just subtract, you get all zeros. Let's choose another row, and we've got 100 rows. Similarly, each column of Y is a copy of lowercase y. Now this y, sh I should transpose it because it's a row vector. And as you can see, it's all zeros. Same thing for 2 up till n. So each row of x is lowercase x and each column of y is y transpose. This is useful when you're plotting surface plots. When you, let's say, want to evaluate a certain 2D function and you want to plot it, all you have to do is simply use this technique. So now I've got x which is discretized from 0 to 5 and y which is discretized from 0 to 10. Let's plot z which is simply x times x minus x squared plus y squared. And let's surf x, y, z and there you've got the plot. Of course I, ha I had to you know scale it properly. Let's do that. So let's say my x was initially minus 2 to 2 with 100 points so as y, let's do a mesh grid, let's evaluate the function, and then let's plot. There you have the function. It's centered at zero. That's why we changed the x and y vectors, and thus the matrices x and y. You can also plot other types of plots, such as x squared plus y squared, then Serve that, get this shape right here. Do the square root, you get this. Okay. And so on. So that's the usefulness of mesh grid and MATLAB. Okay, let's talk about a function that further generalizes the mesh grid. Say you're interested in three or higher dimensions. Let's say you've got three vectors, x1 going from 0 to 5 with spacings of 1, x2 0 to 10, and x3 0 to 15. Let's call the ndgrid function, pass it the three vectors. Should return three matrices corresponding to those three vectors. Those matrices will replicate the grid vectors x1 up to x3 to produce n-dimensional full grids. That means that each 
one of those matrices is three dimensions. 6 by 11 by 16, the size of x1, the size of x2, and the size of x3. Same for the size of x2 and same for the size of x3. So let's see how x1 looks like. Each column of x1 is a replica of the vector x1. Let's look at x2. Each row of x2 is a replica of the vector x2. And each row is per dimension because this is the third dimension we're looking at. And x3, you could see that this is the replica in the third dimension. So each matrix is going to replicate each value of the vector x3. You could also use the same function to plot if you find this more suitable for you, you could also use it to plot the same function we did before. So instead of having to pass it x, y, this function works as such. You could say, oh, my x, y's, I want, and the grid that is discretized from minus 2 till the steps of 0.1 till 2, right? Pass it one vector, and this function will figure out that you want it for both matrices x and y. This is my x, this is my y replicating minus 2 till 2 through the row and column dimensions in x and y respectively. Now let's evaluate z as such and a mesh plot. There you have it. You can also use it to plot other functions. Let's say you want to create a coarse grid for x, y points in the range minus 5 till 5. Let's do that using the nd grid minus 5, let's say steps of 0.1 ending at 5. Let's evaluate z, which is, let's say, sine x squared times cosine y squared, such, and let's surf that. Here you can see the function evaluated. This is cosine x, this is sine x squared times cosine y squared, is that what it looks like. By the way, those functions are used in many applications. They're not any random functions. <laughs> you know, you could interpolate this function you have. What interpolation is, is that you get to guess the points that are not on the grid. So, as you can see here, those are steps of point one, right? Let's, let's do something which is more coarse. So let's say steps of one, evaluate the function, then serve. You have this ugly shape right here. Right. Let's say it's not ugly, it's that the steps are large. Let's say you want to figure out what's going on between the two points so that you end up with a figure close to what we had before, which is this. You want to get this through data points which are not sufficient. How do you do that? Well, first, let's create the points that we're interested in. Call them xi and yi. They're matrices, of course. Points corresponding or found on matrices. So nd grid. From minus 5, now I don't want, the last thing I executed was points with steps of 1, starting at minus 5, ending at 5. Now let's say I'm interested in points of steps of point 1, right? Those are my points of interest. Let's call the interpolate function, enter pn, and pass it x, y, and z that are evaluated at steps of 1, and pass it the steps that we are interested in. So xi, yi, and here, if you're familiar with interpolation, here goes the mode of interpolation. Here is the method, got linear, nearest, p-chip, cubic, and spline. And here's the description. I'm going to go for spline, because it works good, run. And now let's see how the interpolated function looks like. So this is the function that we use for interpolation, right? I'm going to keep it here. And I'm going to open another figure, figure two, which is empty, and run the surf on that, on the interpolated points. And look what we get. This is what the interpolation function figured out using the spline interpolation method. Is it cubic spline? Let's read that. Let's see if it's cubic spline. Um, go down here. Cubic is by itself spline. Yeah, it's a cubic interpolate because some people refer to it as a cubic spline interpolation because it's a cubic based. It's based on not a not end conditions, this type of constraints. Okay, I'm going to close that. So this is what MATLAB figured out. This is what the cubic spline interpolation figured out. And in case you want to see how the true function looks like, well, you can go ahead and regenerate the points at point one, right? Evaluate the function and then serve. This is the true function and this is the interpolated function. 
not so bad, not so bad, but as you can see, we have notches over here. Those values tend to null out at those points right here. So we didn't do a perfect job. We didn't predict exactly everything, but it approximates it relatively good. That's it for an application on ND Grid. Now we're going to talk about functions that determine dimensions or order or shape of arrays and matrices. So I'm going to clear everything out here all, CLC, the length of a matrix. So let's say I have a matrix of size three by five and I'm interested in the length. So all I have to do is called the length of x. L will contain, if it's a matrix, it will contain the number of columns in x. If you're interested in the dimensions, you should call the size of x. You'll get a one by two vector where the first element of this vector is the number of rows and the second element is the number of columns of x, okay? Now, length of a vector, let's say my vector is of size 10, I call length, I get the size of the vector, whether it is a row vector or a column vector. It will return, let's say my matrix is a tall matrix. The length will return the largest dimension. The length, in case of a matrix, will return the largest dimension. So 10 by 5 should return 10, 5 by 10 should return 10. Let's say I've got a, a string array, so this is x, let's run the length of x, I'll get three, right? Because three is larger than two. Now let's do that for additional rows, i, n, j, k, l. Now run the length, it should not be three, it should be four. So really length is a very nice function to grab the maximum dimension of a matrix or the size of a vector because the maximum dimension of a vector is the number of entries. Okay, that's it for length. Size will return both dimensions. So I don't have A, let's define A. Size of A, four by six. In case A is of multiple dimensions, four by six by 13, a one by three vector. Let's call NX and Y and NZ. NX will be four and Y will be six and NZ will be 13. You've also got the number of array dimensions, N dims. And what that does is let's say A is ran three by five, and I call n dims of a, I'll get two. And what that means is that it tells you how many dimensions you have in the matrix. So right here, the matrix is 2D, right? It contains rows and columns, so it will return two. Let's say my a was of four dimensions as such, n dims should return four. Now what is n dims of a vector? Should be two. A vector is one by something, so two. You've also got the number of array elements of a certain matrix. Let's say I've got a four by four matrix, right? And U M E L of A, because four times four is 16. Let's say A is four by one, and U M E L should be four. Say we're working with higher dimensions, three, four, five, six. And what is three times four times five times six? It is 360. So that should be the output of number of A. So that's the most important functions for determining sizes or shapes of arrays. And we've got Boolean functions that returns true or one if the condition is true, else it returns zero or false. So let's call it is matrix of A. It is not a matrix because it is a four dimensional array. Let's call it ran three by four and ask if it's a matrix. It is a matrix because it has two dimensions. A matrix is of two dimensions. Let's say A is a column vector and call is matrix of A. Yes, it is. So vectors, 1D and 2D arrays are matrices. Is a three dimensional a matrix? Let's ask this question. No, it's not. Is it a vector? It is not. But the following is yes. Now, is this a column vector? This is a column vector, whereas the transpose is not. Transpose is a row vector. Is the following empty? No, it's not. But the following is. This is useful when you write some code and the code didn't pass to fill a certain array. So you want to test if this array is empty or not. Now let's say you have a sorted vector as such. Is A sorted? Yes. Now is the inverse of A sorted? 4, 3, 2, 1. No, it's not. And that's basically it. Right, so now let's talk about reshaping and rearranging arrays. The first important function in that category of 
methods is how to sort an array. So given the following array, let's say pi 1 minus pi and the exponential power 1, the array looks like this. Question is how to sort it using MATLAB. All you have to do is call sort as such. So sort will sort your array in increasing order. If you want it in decreasing order, you should pass it another argument stating that you want it in descending order. Descend. By default, it is ascend. Now, passing a matrix, let's say rand 5 by 3, and you call the sort function on that, you could find that the columns are being sorted out. So it was originally like this, 4, 1 was down here, then you've got the 5, 2, then the 70, then the 81 and 96. Calling sort will sort those numbers out. So it will sort per column. If you want sorting per row, you could do this. So the transpose, sort the transpose, or you can do this. So now you can see that the rows are sorted out. So if you pass a number as second index, this is the direction you're sorting in. Do you want to sort per column? If yes, pass one or pass nothing because the default value of direction is one. If you want to sort the rows, pass it two. Now let's say you have an array of characters. So let's say I've got Patsy, I've got Amari, I've also got um, Kini and Salta as such. Or let me put each one on a different row. So they have to be of same sizes. Well, okay, let's do this. Let's keep it as a column or a row. And let's pass sort A. As you can see, the alphabets are sorted in alphabetical order, right? So if you have something like, I don't know, you want to sort the text out containing random letters, there you have. It is useful when you want to extract a certain letter, you sort, then you search. Let's say you have a certain date time. So a date time as such is an object that returns the current date and current time. Let's say, you know, you have a cell. We'll talk about cells in later lectures. It consists of dates. So 2016, November the 10th. Then I have another date, which is 2000 or 1991, 10, 03. Then, you know, you have another date, which is in, let's say, in the future, 2099, May 16, right? So DS is a cell, a three by one cell. Each entry is a character. If you want, you can say class DS, and make sure it's a cell. What about the class of the first index as such? So, in, so cells are indexed by using curly brackets. Anyways, this is my DS variable. I'm going to convert them to a date time array. You can do that using the date time method by passing DS, then passing the format, which is how did I enter my dates? So I passed year, then month, then days as such. So A is a three by one date time array. Class of A is date time. Class A1 is also date time because each entry is of type date time. Now let's sort my date time. So sort date time. You can see that they are sorted from earliest to the latest calendar date. Now going back to a random array, Let's say I would like to know the indices that were shuffled or permuted after sorting. You could do so by getting the second argument of the sort. So sort A, B is the sorted A, and I are the indices after shuffling, right? Which means that A of I is B. Simple as that. Those are useful when you have two columned matrices or tables and you're sorting one and based on the indices that have been permuted, you would also like to permute the column in front of it or facing it, right? Because they're, I don't know, they correspond to similar events or they're correlated, something like that. So this is a good way to keep track of the indices. Now, if you have a matrix, let's say the following matrix, and you would like to, you know, sort all the entries. You don't want to sort the columns separately or the rows separately, no. You'd like a vector, a tall vector, a big vector containing all the elements in the array, but sorted. You can easily do so by remembering that if I pass the colon as argument to the array, it will return a big vector containing all the elements. It will stack each column on top of the other. So sorting that is what you want from smallest to largest. Now let's say I've got a complex vector, 1 plus 3i, minus i, 0, and pi plus 10i. This is my vector. 
let's sort A as it is. What happens? As you can see, it is the real part that has been sorted. So this is how you sort the real part. Let's say you want to sort the imaginary part. All you can do is sort image of A. You see that the elements are sorted out. Here's where you want indices. So B, I is sort the imaginary part of A, right? You've got I. All you have to do now is call A of I, and there you have it. You can see the imaginary part is sorted in decreasing order. Now let's say I have the following matrix. You know, you would like to sort, let me change the first column to following numbers. So I would like the first column to contain the following values. 5, 4, 10, 1, and 11, right? So this is my A. And I would like to sort the rows of A based off the first column. So I would like this row to be first row, this row to be the second one, which it is, and this one to be the third one, fourth one, and the fifth one, right? You can do so using sort rows of A, there you go. Or you could have done this the hard way, so BI sort the first column of A, now you've got the indices of permutation, now you call I as such. There you have it. So this minus sort rows of A is zero, which means they're basically the same. Now let's say you would like the sorting based off the second column. All you have to do is pass it to. Here you can see that the second column is sorted in increasing order or ascending order with shuffled rows, that is. Now that sort rows A1 is the same as sort rows of A, which means that one is the default value. You can also flip the order of elements in a matrix. Getting messy here. Let's say I've got the following matrix. So A looks like this. I call flip of A. As you can see, the last row is now the first row. The middle row is right where it is. And the first is the last. So it basically means that you permute from end to beginning. Um, let me add some more rows. So the fourth row, I like it to be 10, 11, 12, the fifth row, 13, 14, and 15, right? So this is my A. Flip it as such. You could have done the same thing using A and minus one to one, right? Basically gives you the same thing. But this is more complex to read. It basically means that start from the last row with steps of minus one till the first row. In other words, start from the last row and go backwards to make sure that they yield the same output subtract them, you'll get zero. You can also specify the dimension where you'd like to flip. Here we were flipping with respect to the row dimension. You could flip with respect to the column dimension, that is to say the first column is now thrown to the last one, the middle stays right where it is, and the last one becomes the first one. An alternative way is to do the same thing as we did before, the end minus one down to one, but with respect to the column dimension as such. So minus flip A2 should give me all zeros. Now, as we saw with concatenation, vertical concatenation and horizontal concatenation, you've got flip LR of A, that is the same as flip A of 2. So this flip LR means flip from left to right, left to right, or in other words, with respect to the column dimension. So this and this are the same, okay? Likewise, you've got to flip A1 with respect to the rows, and this one is flipping from up to down. So they're basically the same thing. So similarly, concatenation VERT or concatenation horizontal, same thing. You can also rotate an array by 90 degrees. So this is my array. Let's keep it three by three. So back to this. Rotate 90A. What does that mean? It means the first row is now the first column, but counting from the last element to the first element. The second row is the second column. So it's as if you're rotating by 90 degrees in a counterclockwise manner. So you could pass it another argument, so one is default. You can pass it another argument saying by multiples of the second argument, pi over two times the second argument. So this is a rotation by pi, counterclockwise, of course. So by pi, as in this element, rotate it by pi. There you have it, 369, 
is now right here, starting from last to first. So the transpose is done as such, dot apostrophe, or apostrophe if you're sure your numbers are real, or you can use the transpose operator as such. Now if you've got a complex matrix, by the way, J and I are used interchangeably. So J and I are both the imaginary number. If you want complex conjugate transpose, you have to pass it the apostrophe. As you can see, the imaginary parts are flipped. You can also do so using C transpose as such. Both are equivalent. Now going back to this example, let's say you want to reshape your array. That means that you would like to have the same array but with different number of rows or columns or whatever you want. So you've got nine elements. Let's do something different. Let's, uh, let's extend it to 12 elements as such. Let's see what reshape six by two gives us. Six times two is 12, so we could reshape it. As you can see, MATLAB will create another six by two matrix for me containing the elements of A in that order from top to bottom, then left to right. So one, four, seven, ten, as you can see here, then two, five, eight, five, eight, eleven, three, six, nine, twelve, eleven, three, six, nine, twelve. Note that if I pass it an incompatible dimension, I will get an edit. Rows times columns should be equal to the number of entries in A. Let's say I've got the following vector, right? And I call the following function, circ shift A. You have to pass the second argument, let's say one. As you can see, what happened to A is that it has been circularly shifted downwards. So one is two, two is three, three is four, four is five, and five is brought back up, right, as such. So we shifted downwards once. Let's do that one more time three times, four times, five times is back to A, right? Say you had a matrix and you're circularly shifting that matrix by one. As you can see, it shifts each column by the second argument. Now let's say I have this matrix. Now let's say you would like to permute the following matrix dimensions. So you would like the rows to be the columns and the columns to be the rows. You can do so using the permute function where the dimension order is passed as second argument. So it's a row vector saying that if you pass it one, two as such, you're going to get the same thing. So you're keeping the rows right where they are and keeping the columns right where they are. If you do the opposite thing, you're going to transform each row to a column. This means that it is the same thing as transposition. This is useful when you've got multiple dimensions. So let's say I've got a random five by four by two matrix, right? And I'm going to create another matrix, which is, you know, of A, I'm going to put the third dimension first, second dimension, keep it right where it is, and third dimension going to be the first, right? So it's as if I'm permuting the rows with the third dimension and vice versa. The first is the third, and third is the first. Run that, and we're going to check the size of A. The size of A was five by four by two. What is the size of B? Should be two, four, five, okay? So that's all you need to know to start working with arrays and matrices in MATLAB. This is really the fundamental and ground basis of starting your journey and scripting with MATLAB. That's basically it. I'll see you in the next one.